announcement. So um, the slides of the last discussion session by Green, Schwartz and Witten are on the webpage uh, next to, next to the, the name of the discussion session. So please look at the slides and think of good questions for the last discussion session. And also on the homepage of Strings 2021, we have now a questionnaire. So one way to thank us for uh, attending this meeting is to please fill out the questionnaire so we can get your feedback, which will help us, of course, in planning the next Strings meeting. Okay, so now we're ready to start the session. So Stefan Sieber will be the first chair. Okay, thank you very much. I'm um, honored to be the chair for this morning session. And our first talk will be a review talk on celestial amplitudes by Sabrina Pastersky from uh, Princeton University. So please start, Sabrina. Awesome. Um, well, good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for having me. I am very happy to yeah, be here. Which will help us, of course, in planning the next strings meet. OK, so now we're ready to start the session. So Stefan Sieber will, will be the first chair. Uh -oh. OK, thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to be the chair for are you hearing the same loop as me? Yep, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> well, now that we've got to, to have some fun there, um, basically, I'm happy to be starting um, to talk about this program, um, which have we have a lot of uh, people here who have also worked on it. Um, let's start with what celestial geography is and what celestial amplitudes are. So the title of the, the review talk is Celestial Amplitudes, but first, uh, it sits within a bigger program that I guess you could call celestial holography, and that's purporting a duality between gravitational scattering and asymptotically flat space times, and a CFT that's living on the celestial sphere. So if you look up at the night sky, um, there's this for D equals four, 2D celestial sphere, where um, we're trying to find a dictionary between S matrix elements and um, correlators there. So celestial amplitudes are the central object of that. So basically they're S matrix elements in a basis for the scattering states, such that um, they're guaranteed to transform as conformal correlators in uh, co-dimension two. So in this case, for this talk, I'm gonna be looking at 4D and um, then a 2D celestial sphere. Okay, so the plan for today is the following. So we're gonna break it into two parts where the first part is going to be a bit of a review of a review, um, talking, taking a step back to the original motivation for why would we be looking at um, the celestial CFT. And in the second part, we're going to go through uh, different aspects of celestial amplitudes um, to kind of see how uh, the, the structure of the dictionary and um, pass forward in that. So um, of course, everything that I present today, it's review talk, uh, is thanks to a lot, a lot of people. So I've tried to list uh, as many of them as like um, uh, as possible uh, here, but of course it's a growing list and um, um, many interesting uh, contributions. I won't be able to talk about in detail today, but um, fortunately we have a discussion session this afternoon. So that time is in uh, Brazilian time um, where Andy and Tomas will be leading that. And so plenty of opportunities to go into uh, things that I wasn't able to cover in this talk. Great, okay. So part one of the talk, asymptotic symmetries. First step is to match even just the global symmetry. So um, when we want to say that there's a dictionary between uh, the celestial CFT and S matrix elements, um, the symmetry on both sides should be the same. And the first uh, statement is that this is supposed to be a co-dimension two CFT. And so where does that conformal symmetry come from? Well, that's just going to be Lorentz transformations of Minkowski space. So um, those Lorentz transformations are going to turn into my global conformal transformations, the celestial sphere. And so Lorentz invariance in the bulk is going to translate then into um, this formal covariance depending on uh, the external states that we choose to scatter. So also, even though I'm starting with asymptotic symmetries, I want to keep in mind that the end goal here is to connect to amplitudes. So whenever I say something about what's happening in the um, like asymptotic limits of the space time, I want to connect that to um, the picture of what I'm doing for my external particle states. So normally um, I would have a momentum space, a set of on-shell momenta. So if it's massive, it's parameterized by a point on a hyperboloid. And if it's massless, there is a uh, a null cone of momentum. And so for S matrix elements, we typically specify the set of on-shell momenta for my in and my out particles. Now in the space-time picture, I would wanna take a Cauchy slice and specify um, the data on that slice. Now, because we were interested in quantum gravity, we want to be able to have the metric fluctuate in the bulk. And so we really wanna pin down uh, the free data at the asymptotic boundaries. So we're gonna be looking at the conformal boundary of uh, asymptotically flat space times. Okay. So to go about doing that, the first thing is just look at the Penrose diagram for Minkowski space. Um, interesting things happen when you add horizons, et cetera. But for the purpose of this talk, 
all I'm going to need is asymptotically flat space times. And basically the, um, the causal structure is gonna look the same here. So the, the important point for me is the um, disconformal boundary. So what happens if you look at um, Penrose um, diagram from Minkowski space? So we've basically rescaled distances down so we can just look at the causal structure. And the interesting thing about um, asymptotically flat space times is that they will have um, boundary components which are null. So we have uh, time like uh, past and future infinity here, space like infinity here, and then we have um, these um, S2 cross R um, null hypersurfaces, which capture incoming and outgoing uh, radiation. So basically, a massless particle will enter and exit um, at antipodal points if it were freely propagating through of um, scry minus and scry plus. And so that's going to be important for us because um, when we have this picture of um, massless scattering, on the one hand, we know that we have this like cone of unshell momenta. And on the other, in the space-time picture, we're gonna have the data where we push our Cauchy slice up to uh, this boundary. Good, okay. So now in the interest of, again, connecting something that's we're saying in, um, for, for asymptotically flat space-time, so what's happening in the amplitude, we just wanna look at the free mode extension of the field operators. And the nice thing about that is that when you take the large R limit holding you fixed, so again, U is this retarded time here, if I go out to large R, essentially I have a very rapidly oscillating phase um, in the, the, the dot product between um, the direction that I'm pointing at on the night sky and the direction of the momentum of the particle. And so because of that, basically the angular dependence in this uh, integral localizes to delta function. So I ended up seeing that the large R limit of my metric perturbation will essentially capture the um, in and the out uh, modes. So in the case that if you have a vacuum on the one side, you'll kill half this term. But um, basically here, what I'm saying is you see that only one integral is left over. So the S2 part goes away. And essentially now this U dependence um, turns into an omega dependence if you Fourier transform. So that's the connection here, which is gonna be good because essentially we're gonna wanna relate um, soft theorems in, uh, in the standard amplitudes picture to uh, what are gonna be asymptotic symmetries in this picture. Good, okay, and this is a quick aside. If we wanna do the same thing for massive particles, you can also. And in that case, it's basically that if you have um, a particle with a definite momentum at the end, essentially if you hyperbolically like foliate Minkowski space, then the point on that asymptotic hyperboloid that it hits would correspond to the momentum direction. And of course, in the one case, that's like uh, the, the this curvature there is corresponding to large X squared versus in the other case, the this hyperboloid size is set by the mass of the particle in the momentum space picture. So one could do a similar type of set of point approximation um, and I point to references completely in to see that worked out. Okay, so I said that the goal of this part of the talk was to talk about um, synthetic symmetry. So let's go about doing that. So when we're interested in gravitational scattering in these asymptotically flat space times, you're looking at solutions uh, to Einstein's equations with vanishing cosmological constant and some assumptions about the, the matter stress tensor. So this was done by Bondi, Vandenberg, Metzner, and Sachs back in the 60s. Um, and the key point said that the goal of this part of the talk was to talk essentially about, you're um, looking at the metric and perturbations of the metric near future null infinity now instead of um, at some other um, boundary. So in this case, you have the flat metric in the first line. And then the corrections to that are all parameterized by subleading powers in one over R. And so again, this is how you would identify here the, um, the, the radiation is in these um, angle dependent terms that are just subleading to the round sphere metric, which um, has a different form. So you can subtract, ex extract it from the, the ZZ component. Um, and the part, point of doing this expansion, so first of all, if you really wanna study the phase space and the symmetries of this um, class of solutions, you're gonna first have to pick a convenient gauge so that you can make sense of what each of the terms in those um, in the metric are. And then you want to also specify physical falloffs. So, so, so this Bondi gauge metrics already, that process has already been done. Um, and the, the fun thing about it is that there's this uh, balance that you have between um, what falloffs you want to allow for, um, say, both the large R dependence and then the, the U behavior of uh, the metric along future null infinity or in the same thing for past null infinity. And um, you don't want to allow like unphysical solutions, but you also don't want to kill physical solutions. So that's a bit of a balance there. And then depending on what you do on that side, uh, the, the residual symmetries are going to change. So 
and why I point out that it's a little bit of a balance in the sense that there actually have been some, um, we'll see examples where the asymptotic symmetry group proposal has slightly changed uh, based on trade-offs that one can make uh, there. So the, the statement of what a residual or asymptotic symmetry is, is that I have these diffeomorphisms, they're going to change my metric, but they're going to keep the fall-offs. So the, the, um, this expansion in one over R relative to the flat metric, even if the coefficients of the expansion changes, the, the powers in R are the same. And so my, the, those sets of diffeomorphisms will preserve that class of solutions. Um, and this asymptotic symmetry group are the ones that basically act on the data that survives in the large R limit. And so I, my allowed symmetries are the ones that preserve those fall offs. My trivial ones are the ones that fall off fast enough that they never change the data um, on my slices. And so the asymptotic symmetry group can be a lot larger than the isometries of any given metric. So like Minkowski space, especially because it's not supposed to preserve a single metric, it's supposed to preserve a class. And also once you think about the, the fact that you have um, generic meta configurations will break any isometries that you'd have, um, it's it's good to, I guess, like the natural thing would be to try to identify um, these asymptotic symmetries as opposed to like um, sticking to a given um, space time and asking what are the asymmetries because you would expect that in the large you would be able to see some remnant of a Poincaré invariance even if the solution itself that you're looking at is not um, Poincaré invariant. So what we find is that, of course BMS isn't just larger than Poincaré, it's infinitely larger. And so the next slide will go into which, um, in what sense it's infinitely larger, but essentially this is the power or like the, the, the stepping off point for this program into celestial holography uh, is noticing that there is this enhancement of symmetries that um, we want to make manifest. Okay, so the two sets of symmetries that we'll be interested in for the gravitational case are super translations and super rotations. So in the one case, you can think of, um, if you look at different parts in the night sky, you have the sphere, and then you also have a, a like time at which radiation hits that sphere or like crosses null infinity. Um, and what a super translation is gonna do is let you basically shift uh, the U coordinate independently at different points in the night sky. So this is much bigger than a translation, which would just be essentially like the L equals one modes or zero mode, like of just translating everything um, with special functions of Z and Z bar that terminate at quadratic order. So super rotations on the other hand are gonna let you go from just global rotations to local conformal transformations of this celestial sphere. And so this is already kind of the tantalizing hint that oh, maybe we can define some sort of stress tensor um, using using the fact that basically the, 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 these transformations are these um, CKVs like we would see in a 2D CFD. So this is a special aspect of um, of being in 4D versus in 2D is like, right, this is the same thing that you see in, in 2D CFTs where you go from uh, the global conformal group to now these local conformal transformations. Uh, hopefully later in the talk, I'll discuss a little bit more about how we, you can still apply these same structures in, in other dimensions. But I did want to point out that right now, this enhancement is, is special to that. Um, but the the nice thing here also is that um, somehow hindsight is, is 2020 in the sense that originally, if you wanted to say that I want everything to be globally defined in the celestial sphere, then you'd still knock this back down to, to, to Lorentz transformations. Um, and then in the context of um, celestial CFT, now, because we're basically more okay with, with having punctured spheres and whatnot, uh, these transformations will basically induce uh, at localized points um, changes to the round metric. And so that's where, um, these are some point thrown out, debated or whatever. Um, so that's good to keep in mind. Okay, so the the next stage of this is to basically understand the extent to which um, these symmetries are actually realized in the S matrix. And the quick route of seeing that is essentially actually this really nice observation by Strominger, which is that word identities for those asymptotic symmetries are equivalent to just soft theorems in, in the uh, S matrix side. And so um, the point of this talk is to use this as motivation for celestial amplitude. So I'm just gonna outline like the two features that you would need to, to basically motivate this. Um, the first thing is that the canonical charges in gravity are gonna be co-dimension two. So we think of our Cauchy slices living at future null infinity, say, and the same for past null infinity for these two definitions of the charges acting on the in and the out states. And then you have this data that is like say the bonding mass or the angular momentum aspect at spatial infinity. And now I can write that, of course, as a total U derivative if I add a corresponding term at the other U boundary. 
And that trick basically turns it into clearly like a, um, a zero energy, like it's just, so it's a, a U integral. So it's picking out something zero of um, zero energy frequency part of whatever is the, the object that then is left over on the, uh, the uh, null infinity. And then it turns out you can use constraint equations or whatnot to, to find out what that is. But intuitively also, um, because these symmetries are mostly spontaneously broken, except for the, the ones that the point gray preserves the vacuum, um, there's going to be a part of the metric that will shift under doing this diffeomorphism. So to get that shift, there's a term in the chart that's going to be linear in the metric. And so there's some term here where you literally are just plugging in the mode expansion that I pointed out earlier and picking out the zero frequency limit of that. So that will be the quote unquote soft charge that um, is basically inhomogeneously shifting the, the, the metric field when you do some asymptotic symmetry transformation. Okay, so that's all I need from the, this is like wonderful like old story about um, asymptotic symmetries. Um, the key point here is that not only do you have this equivalence between uh, this asymptotic symmetry uh, group, word identities and the soft theorems, but you also are naturally recasting those guys as a 2D conformal field theory word identity. So, Basically, this equivalence um, was like a lot of papers starting in like 2013, 2014 um, there. And it's very cool because also from that time, it was noticed that basically the, the, the structure of the soft theorems was such that it kind of looked like it could be um, interpreted in a 2D CFT language. So this celestial holography program and celestial amplitude program basically is taking that and pushing it just to see how far you can go with the full amplitude. So just to, to point out what that, um, first example, I guess, is it's kind of hinting that you really want to go to this 2D celestial CFT um, interpretation is that there's some zero energy modes so here, like I have the U integral of the metric mode that was appearing in my expansion. Um, and so this zero particular zero mode of the metric um, is a candidate stress tensor in the sense that within amplitudes, the soft theorem turns into what looks, I can make look like, or Anna and, um, and Prahar and, and uh, Dan can make look like a, uh, um, a, a correlator and a word identity for the, the stress tensor. And so the point is to unpack the fact that it looks like this. So right now it's like, oh, this is this is a nice equation I would have for my uh, TDCFT. But the point is, is that this insertion of this mode here is coming on the amplitude side from a soft theorem. And then I want to be able to interpret my in and my out states in terms of operators. So already with this picture of what the on-shell momenta are, um, there's a, for massless particles, there's an actual point on the celestial sphere, which they would then go to. Um, but I need to somehow convert their energies into um, to a basis where they're diagonalized. So essentially, if I want these weights to just be numbers, then I would want to go to Rindler energy eigenstates. And so that's gonna kick us off into celestial amplitudes. Great, okay. So we're done with part one, On to part two. We have now this understanding that the um, infrared physics via these soft theorems are hiding this infinite symmetry enhancement then we can try to take advantage of that by basically turning each of those soft theorems into some currents in this uh, in this 2D picture. And so in order to then fully go to that 2D picture, we need to have these operators that are um, have definite H and H bar, and that requires a change of basis for the scattering states. So we just wanna now look at the wave packets that we're scattering to, um, to talk about amplitudes in the spaces. So I'm gonna define a conformal primary wave function to be a function of a point X in my space time and then a reference point for the case of 4D and 2D, this is a point on the complex plane. Um, and I demand that it transforms as follows. So essentially, uh, if I have a spin for this, this field, that's the representation of the Lorentz group here acting. And then I get some conformal weights based on the delta and J um, when I do the corresponding Mobius transformation in the celestial sphere at the same time as I do uh, the Lorentz transformation. So if you, the easiest way to see what this is is to write X in terms of um, Pauli matrices. Um, and then you have lambda as a function of A, B, C, and D. So these are SL2C. Um, so basically now what I'm gonna look at in this context is just the case where the spin matches the, uh, the magnitude of the helicity. Um, and then also that ones that solve the appropriate uh, source-free uh, equations of motion. Now, if I give you such a solution and I have my mode expansion of my operator like I'd written up before, and I have a Cauchy slice and I have an inner product, I can just construct an operator that will effectively look like it lives in 2D. And so, right, so what's happening is this, the X part is being integrated over this inner product. Uh, the conformal dimensions of this guy are guaranteed by the, the wave function that I happen to be scattering. 
And the W and W bar dependence here to make it look like it's a local operator in, in 2D is again coming from the fact that these wave functions have this um, like bulk boundary propagator type dependence on a, a point on this plane and a point in the bulk. And so the wave functions roughly will look like um, they'll have the, the dimensions coming from factors of one over like Q dot X. So you can imagine this hyperplane in Minkowski space that's uh, the, the normal for that is setting the reference direction um, where this operator is gonna sit on this um, celestial sphere, which we've kind of projected down to the plane. Um, now, one other caveat is that these amplitudes will carry additional labels for either the particles in and out. So from the point of view of the fact that the, the metric near um, in the large element fix U looks like it's like uh, an integral along uh, future null infinity, there's a similar thing where the, the operator that you think of inserting um, in a correlation function, the bulk would be at past null infinity. So, so keep in mind that's a little bit different in the sense that we're saying that there's one celestial sphere instead of two celestial spheres, but adding an extra label to each of the operators in it. And um, we can at some point talk about going to 2-2 two, two and, and basically how that analytic continuation there maybe can say something. Um, okay, so for massless particles, which is just the easiest case to do because basically there's only one integral to do, um, I can, you would, one can quickly see that the wave functions that one write down that transform as follows, as, as previously said, which this, um, X Lorentz transformation and W um, Mobius transformation giving a nice prefactor at front. Those guys are actually going to be up to a proportionality constant, just gauge uh, equivalent to doing a Mellon transform of the plane wave. So right, so we are normally scattering just the, these plane wave packets with some polarization tensors. And just by integrating over the energies with a certain weight, I can trade out the energy for conformal dimension. And so also point out that everything I'm saying here can also apply to the case of um, massive, um, particles. And there the, the technical burden of, of course, is just that like the transform that you're doing to take you from amplitudes to celestial amplitudes is a little bit more work because there's an extra integral. Um, but again, you're basically using just the SL2C covariance. And so in the context of ABS-CFT, we're more familiar with um, thinking of the embedding space as something that's formal. Um, and in this context, we're basically taking that embedding space point to be anywhere in the, in the, um, in the, um, in that, flat space. And so now um, that, that's on the, the position space side of things. And in the momentum space side of things, we actually naturally have a hyperboloid. So here we're basically using a bulk to boundary propagator for the point where the momentum is for the normal S matrix element to boost it up to a reference point um, that is set by me. So the operator is sitting then at W and it's smeared over the, the actual uh, momentum space amplitude versus in the massless case, the point at which a particle heads out is naturally fixing um, the point in the night sky. And then I have to smear over just the energies there. So there's a lot, one integral for every particle instead of three. Great, okay. So the fancy thing here is our object of study. So celestial amplitude will be for the masses case, this guy. I'm taking my amplitude and I am melon transforming it over every energy. Um, so this is a omega i here. Um, and so this guy is guaranteed to transform like a correlator of quasi primaries because the external particle states are now in boost eigenstates. So that transform can be thought of as acting on the, the amplitude itself or on the basis um, states for my S matrix element. And so we have these transformations for the states after Mellon transforming, and they give us this covariance of the amplitudes. So I have this object that I, the one technically it is the image of, um, it's, it's the, in the sense that if you trivial are saying that like I have my map between S matrix elements and um, and uh, correlators in a 2D CFT, this is the map. But of course, the dictionary, the interesting part of that dictionary is understanding exactly what features of the amplitudes um, are translating over. So that's what we're going to be getting into. The first step to notice, though, uh, is that I can basically invert this transform just fine if the delta are in the principal series, and so. Um, this principal series um, set of dimensions is going to be the ones that capture uh, finite energy radiation. Now, when we look at translations, because everything right now has basically been making Lorentz transformations look really nice, um, but translations will shift the, the, the conformal dimension. And so what one's, one wants to think of is one can still um, formally write the, the data off of the principal series in terms of smearing on the principal series. This is something that we were looking into uh, with, with Donay and Poom. But um, it's natural to kind of think of this paradigm as um, the data on the principal series is capturing the, the, um, the scattering data for like everything that's not zero energy. But then um, you want to look at how that amplitude behaves uh, uh, 
as a function of delta in this complex plane. So we're going to be looking at delta that are off of the principal series and what follows. Okay, so one other thing to point out. So the, basically, I'm trying to point out the things that make it like, okay, so Lorenz invariance gives you this correlator. Great. Now, like, this, what, what about it is weird. Like, can we just go open the yellow book and then do something with it, or do we have to be careful? So the other thing to point out is that essentially this amplitude that you're integrating over, of course, has a momentum conservation constraint in it. So um, again, in the last slide, I was pointing out that the translation generators shift the dimensions. Well, here, they also do this funny business of giving you this delta function in some momentum. So what does that look like? If I just literally want to take some tree level amplitude and write down the celestial amplitude, it's quite easy to do technically because I'm integrating over the, only the energies. I have a bunch of delta functions there. So I have a delta function from the, the sum of a momenta. And then when I do this integral, I have a scale integral and I also have um, the um, simplex integral. So somehow I basically have like five delta functions that are sitting there that can localize up to five melon transform. Um, so in terms of spinner helicity variables, right, I'm picking the direction of the particles to stay fixed and finding the, the modulus of the, the um, that null vector such that the poly, null polygon closes. So um, the remaining delta functions that are left over when I am in the case of scattering less than five uh, particles will mean that the correlation functions are singular. So that's not super great from the point of view of trying to like just directly connect to your, your garden variety 2D CFTs. And so one either gets discouraged or uses that as an interesting, um, well, in one sense, it's a playground to try to like make sure that everything you're taking for granted isn't like technically forced on you by covariance. covariance. And the other thing is to um, still um, to see what happens. So the aim again of this map, doing this map in the first place was that we wanted to um, be able to use CFT techniques to learn about amplitudes. So you wanna use the powers of these symmetries that you find in the IR to, to, to constrain scattering. To constrain gravitational scattering in the bulk. So we're already seeing two problems or like, eh, like issues, which are, first of all, um, this dual CFT is exotic in the sense that its spectrum is complex. The singular behavior at low point amplitudes is strange. It still is conformally covariant, but it's basically like delta function pieces instead of the ordinary power laws for the two point functions of two, uh, two operators. Um, meanwhile, the quantity that we want to look at in 4D is also unusual because we're probing energy that's scattered at all scales. So we see that there's this scale integral that's left over um, that is really uh, looking at um, the amplitude at all energies. And so if one wants to take it the, in mind um, that normally you would have some sort of effective theory that is only valid up to some cutoff scale, then this is going to be a problem because technically this object is defined for having these external states at, um, that, that make it to all boosted versions of the other energies. And so one could be take that also as a concern, or one can try to take that as a feature. And so in what follows, I'm gonna talk about different limits of, um, of uh, the S matrix elements and how they're encoded uh, in this 2D CFT um, and try to advocate that the, the bugs or what looks like it could be weird and scary are actually interesting um, and see the fun things that people have been up to. Okay, so we're doing fine on time, it should be good. Um, I'll use, um, Okay, good. So, so now to understand how to effectively use this framework, we have to build up our dictionary. And I'm going to focus on three aspects of celestial amplitudes. Um, and my bias is always towards this infrared stuff. Um, but um, some very, very cool things have happened recently in the colonial ultraviolet cases that I will get to. So um, the, the point here is that each of these, the, um, I guess, items listed in line are all kind of connected. And so that's fun because someone who's coming from interest, being interested in the soft theorem side of the story and these like, uh, putative currents in the celestial CFT can connect it to interesting um, constraints on, on the, these S matrix elements. And then one can keep going from there. Okay, so the first thing to point out is again, you're integrating over energy scales. When I have, I look at the contribution of to uh, that Mellon integral from the low frequency part, then basically um, what like Chung, De La Fontaine, Sundram pointed out is that I would expect to pull in that weight now. So what's interesting is that on the one hand, soft theorems, like it would be surprising that you change the spaces where you're integrating over all energy scales and you still get soft factorization theorems, but you do. And in this case, instead of a pull, uh, we're basically resolving uh, the omega goes to zero limit of a single particle going soft. So at different powers of omega, there's a leading soft theorem here and a subleading soft theorem here. Those different soft theorems actually get kind of spread out in this uh, Mellon transform variable where now 
those are poles at um, delta equals one in one case, and then delta equals zero for the subletting stuff, graviton theorem. So you already see that kind of nice kind of separation of uh, different soft theorems uh, in, in, the, in this picture. Now, for all of the soft theorems that, like, there is no, um, I guess, question of, like, whether they get correct, so, like, one loop exact corrections to the stress sensor, et cetera, you basically have a nice asymptotic symmetry interpretation because these conformal primary functions that we're using to set up these states just reduce to becoming pure gauge. And so for each spin, you can list off which ones they are. And so the leading soft theorem in, in ENM has is this large U1, like so gauge symmetries where the, the choice of gauge parameter varies on the celestial sphere and makes it out to the infinity. And then for the gravitational case, you have super translations and super rotations or diff S2 for those two soft theorems I was pointing out. So now we're taking an amplitude where we're taking one of the external legs soft and you can, I guess, investigate the amplitude and see that there's a pole and this factorization at these values of delta. Or one can note the state that I'm preparing basically is um, going pure gauge. And so that's how I like, am essentially seeing the asymptotic symmetry interpretation in this new set, set of wave functions of basically a gauge fixing of, of these guys. And one thing I want to also point out is that those special values of the dimension um, can come from the representation theory. So what we have is we have basically just looking at the global conformal multiplets, you want to have a, a primary state, which is going to be annihilated by L1 and L1 bar. So these are just Lorenz generators. And then you find form descendants of it by acting with um, L negative one and same with L negative one bar. So I can have a primary descendant for special values of those dimensions. And those dimensions are going to be exactly ones that correspond to these, these poles in the amplitude. So on the one hand, there's a infinite tower of conformally soft theorems that were studied, uh, I think noticed by Guevara and, um, and others. And then also recently have appeared in this paper uh, with Guevara, Himwich, Pate, and Strominger. So um, Andy has this fun W infinity paper recently. Maybe he can talk about it, that in the discussion session. And then for the point of view of the soft theorems that I kind of motivated this program to begin with, those guys are um, descending to operators that generate these aesthetic symmetries. So the soft charges I mentioned are, are in the same multiplet. And this is noticed by Web Energy et al. And the symplectic partner of those operators are basically interpretable as dressings. So essentially the soft theorems and the structures of the conformal multiplets and the notion of IR divergences and dressings are all connected, which I guess it makes sense in hindsight, but it's nice to see that like different ventures of like people who are looking at trying to find differential equations to constrain amplitudes in the spaces and people looking at IR divergences and dressings kind of all are landing on the same, same topic. Um, okay, so one thing to point out here with the dressing is that of course the, um, the fact that I have this soft theorem is I guess also connected to the fact that actually if I didn't have any, I said like, I'm just gonna scatter some in particles, some out particles, no radiation whatsoever, I would get zero because basically there's also these virtual exchanges that with, um, when you lower the IR cutoff, they diverge eventually when you we sum over it so that you have um, vanishing amplitudes. So one thing nice about the original first part of the talk in that program uh, is the statement that you can reinterpret that vanishing of those amplitudes as um, being a symptom of the fact that you aren't um, preserving or like you're not conserving these asymptotic charges, symmetry charges. And so that interpretation is nice from the point of view of people going into like saying, well, what happens when you have horizons? Do you have extra um, constraints there? Um, but for, for, for the case here, um, it motivates also looking at dressed operators. And so um, Pate and Ray Kuluru, uh, Connie Hamid and Andy um, pointed out that um, when you go to this conformal basis, you can actually pick a, a form of the dressing such that it also has a definite weight. And then the nice thing about this, um, this operator is that you can actually interpret now essentially the, the smearing that's appearing in this definition in terms of the, so you just look at the, the frequency integral that's appearing here to see, identify that if you don't have in the fitting of dressing any kind of cutoff in, in the frequency, that this picks out a delta equals one mode of these A's and A daggers. And then the, the guy looks like a vertex operator where basically the SL2C ascendant of the guy, if you go up the diamond, is sitting in this dressing. And so the fun thing about that then is it leads you to thinking about um, conformally soft sectors of celestial CFT. Those correlators of vertex operators there are basically governed by the spontaneous symmetry breaking dynamics. Um, so you identify the spectrum by trying to see like where the soft things are gonna be. And then you see that essentially you have these effective uh, theories for these to, to model like um, the breaking of diff S2 to Virasoro, in this case, the large U1 
um, symmetry being modeled by a free boson. So from the point of view of Truman trying to construct a nice example 2D CFT, these are like the, the easiest ones to start from. These are the, just like the, the parts that capture the spontaneous symmetry breaking dynamics of asymptotic symmetries in the bulk. Um, and the other interesting thing about it, and one of the, I guess, um, obstacles to, again, interpreting some of the celestial CFT story was that um, the, the levels that you would get were naively zero from the point of view of taking two, um, say, photons um, soft. But there's an additional symplectic partner mode, which is this pure gauge guy appearing in the dressing. And, um, and vanish observation by Nan, uh, Pate and Sturminger is that you can read off from the Cuspolomos dimension uh, levels in these uh, theories. And this has been extended to gravity too. So here, this slide, we're talking about, there's some nice toy models for these asymptotic symmetry breaking dynamics and non-zero levels can come out of these um, resummed uh, exchanges. So the next thing I wanna go to from the soft story is to um, the uh, collinear limits. So there again, I'm highlighting another the papers by uh, the Taylor group and uh, Andy, uh, Yuan, uh, Pate, and uh, Anna. So there I can, so far I've been looking at special values of the delta. Instead of that, I can turn to uh, special limits of the positions on the celestial sphere. And so collinear limits should be governed by celestial OPE. And so if I take two gluons collinear, um, one can work out the, like looking at the operators for the interactions in the bulk um, that the leading singular form uh, is this. And so the kind of fun thing about this particular paper is that they're showing that they can show that there's recursion relations that there are symmetry constraints that govern this C that then let you solve for it. So that's kind of fun. So from the point of view of if I just had an amplitude and a melon transform, I can read it off from that. Um, but the fact that I can also use symmetries to derive it shows some of the power of this kind of exotic celestial CFT where now like the dimensions are um, in some sense like parameters more so than like operators with that dimension are in the theory or not. So translation variance gives you some relation. Similarly, a normalization comes from Sokolow theorem. And then just to harken back to the, the work with these like um, these conformal multiplets, um, you get extra symmetries coming from um, the fact that basically there's a um, kernel when you try to ascend from the soft operator up to the radiative guys. And so there are extra global symmetries corresponding to the subleading soft gluon theorem um, that gives you one more recursion relation so you can solve for what matches the, the collinear limit. So this is a really nice calculation. I would recommend it. If those interested, like it's a nice paper because it's, it's really highlighting the power of, of um, using symmetries to learn something about celestial CFTs versus everything being forced by kinematics. So, or, or in this case, at least the kinematics are, are non-trivial. Um, so, okay, now, so this other thing to point out is that with kind of this paradigm in mind, you can um, notice that by looking at collinear limits, even though your three-point amplitudes were very singular, you can extract the, the CIJ case. And so we have the spectrum, we have this data for the CFT, and you can try to apply other CFT machinery to it. And so there have been interesting papers by authors below um, looking at both doing comparable block decompositions and different signatures for these amplitudes. Um, and try to interpret what's happening in the exchanges, rate of quantization, et cetera. So there's a lot that goes on when you kind of are assuming that you really can apply CFD machinery to these celestial CFTs. And then also pushing these um, symmetries that you're getting from uh, the soft theorems to, to have these differential equations and null state conditions for your uh, S matrix elements. So those are two interesting uh, directions to push in there. And then I just want to close off. So I think I'm, I'll be fine on the time. Um, we have, let's close off with some looking at two to two scattering. So in the past, I guess I was focusing more on the fact that everything's singular and the dimensions are weird, but now let's look at how, how nice things can actually get. So um, this is going to be based off of Arkani Hamid, Pate, Barbara Clear, and Strominger. And so just starting from the fact that you have a function of Mandelson invariance times this momentum conserving delta function, this is my four point amplitude of momentum space. And when I do this transformation, part of this transformation is just guaranteeing the conformal covariance, because again, I'm in boost eigenstates, so we expect this. Um, this this extra delta function was that feature I was mentioning about where how these constraints um, make things a little bit singular. But the nice thing about it then is that this, the part that kind of remains, I can probe the the S and T dependence of of this uh, the Mandelson dependence of this amplitude via this factor here. So what I have now is I basically have a stripped amplitude that probes scattering at all energy scales, where now this was S and this is T. Um, so fixed angle scattering is keeping Z fixed, and so. Just the last two slides pointing out that 
um, the convergence of this integral is tied to the ultraviolet behavior. So something that's very UV sensitive. So depending on how M will behave as a function of, I guess, this Mandelson S, you will or won't have different um, pole structures in this beta plane, which is the Mellon transform for the, the, the uh, Mandelson variable. So you have an imprint of the UV completion in the analytic structure in, in, in this beta plane. And similarly, if you look at an effective expansion around the, the zero frequency, um, you can see that there's, first of all, if there's logarithmic runnings, you get um, poles, um, higher order poles, instead of just simple poles, you have double poles, et cetera, um, coming from these logs. And you can also try to translate positivity constraints uh, from like, that you know from amplitudes to then uh, positivity constraints on the residues. So basically, all I want to say in this slide is that there's some very interesting even recent work last week from um, Chang Hong, Hong and Lee continuing that effort. Um, and so there, you're at a stage where you basically you can translate over um, the um, statements from amplitudes that you know to statements about celestial CFTs. And some, some of the features are pretty nice. Like the, the fact that these logs turn into like multiple poles, the fact that the soft theorems are separated out. And then the fact that the um, statements about EV behavior somehow seem like natural to impose in the spaces too are kind of nice. So now this goes just my conclusion. So I have lots of time for questions. There's this two more slides. Um, we have a framework that makes symmetry enhancements manifest. It reorganizes soft and collinear limits and it's sensitive to the very deep UV. So that's nice. And we've given examples of how to translate features of amplitudes into objects within the celestial CFT, whether it's um, conformal soft theorems and also uh, operator product expansions, so these different currents, et cetera, and also what kinds of properties we can demand of celestial CFT. So in this case, the statement that, um, that you have no poles in some region of this complex beta plane, et cetera, for two to two. So these are what we've tried to motivate and review today. And the next step forward are basically to try to expand this dictionary. And so like we sure we have mapped from the S matrix elements to um, to uh, these um, objects in celestial CFT, but you really don't want to just have the correlation functions. You want to basically probe bulk physics with it. And so the way to do that would be to connect to adjacent subfields and to also look for an intrinsic construction of, of the sky. So you can kind of see we're motivated by um, aspects of gravity and of like IR limits of scattering to look for this framework. And now the the goal for the next uh, the years is to look at how we can use tools or like um, uh, understanding from different subfields to kind of tie in or and feedback hopefully too. So that's the structure. And then I'll just close with a bunch of people who've been working on different aspects and kind of trying to show where, where they're focused on with, with where their, their names are located. But thank you guys for, for hearing me out. And um, thank you to everybody whose names are on these slides. So um, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Sabrina, for this great talk. So let's thank uh, Sabrina for this um, wonderful talk and also these beautiful figures. Um, we have uh, now time for questions. So first um, question is goes to Shu Sheng Shao. Hi, Sabrina. Thank you for the excellent talk. It was uh, re really nice. Uh, I have a question kind of along the future direction you, you mentioned. I was, just, I was just wondering that there has been a lot of developments on computing correlation functions of the yeah. celestial CFT. Do we have any idea to compute, for example, the torus partition function of the celestial CFT? Okay, so I, right, like the, the, the accentuate, I think I would, I'm would i gonna defer to Andy a little bit for, for that because I know that, for instance, I we have the notion of this torus from 2-2 signature, right. uh, but then it's Lorenzi. Okay, so, so the, their, the modular parameter seems to be fixed in that context, I think. Though the fact that you can make the conformal block decompositions work consistently, like say you take Taylor's paper and then you take Andy's paper, so the, the two different conformal block decompositions and different signatures. Um, and like, so in some sense, we want to define the data for the scattering in either case. And I think that that power probably implies that you can then change the, the, the manifold that you're on. So you can go from the celestial sphere or the, the celestial torus that happens to be given to you by 2 2 to some other guy. But I don't. Um, like in some sense, I would say that the people who are studying these, like the operators that you need to add to talk about dressings, et cetera, are trying to basically see what exactly the states are. So I would, I, I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that there, that a lot of people could talk about what they think about it, maybe uh, in the discussion system for the, the 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 two two people. And then my my take would be that I want to understand any dressing, like extra states that have to appear from, um, yeah, that that, that I'm kind of maybe missing, um, just looking at the radiative guys. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, so next question uh, is, goes to a uh, note of Institute for Advanced Study. So uh, it's Yuan Malasino. Yeah, I have a, a question about these poles that and yeah. the omega variable that you discussed. Yes. Yeah. So you said that they are present in field theory, but not in gravity. Can, yeah. can one see what happens to them as we turn on the Newton constant? Uh, yeah, so I guess, um, so this is again based on Nima and Andy's paper. So hopefully I'm not gonna end up saying something too, too fast there. So they're, um, like they're looking at gravitational, like so gravity photon interactions. And so I guess the, the M that's there is, is capturing the, the orders of the G Newton. Um, I, so, so I, I guess, I, I mean, I have to think of maybe, I, I will defer if there's a quick answer that anybody, that any would have, but if my, my intuition would be um, that, okay, so, so somehow the rate that these poles go away is supposed to be related to um, how the bulk point um, singularity is resolved in, in the ADS context. So I guess the, the funny thing about it is sometimes when you have this, like it's coming from this, getting this exponential damping, giving a gamma function where it, you can see where the poles are. So I don't know if I have at the moment because I haven't um, thought about the UV side of it as much uh, intuition for what's going, how that, that transition happens. Um, but I guess in some sense, like the, the only funny thing about it is somehow they, they, this um, rough, uh, like, like the change from this behavior to that behavior is what's killing the poles. Um, and I, I know that you could capture order by order, like what the, the gravitational coupling is doing via like an expression like this, but I don't know if I have a good intuition for how it really like goes like on and off. Maybe if, if, if anyone wants to add to that, I'm happy to, because yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you want, you have one last comment or? Oh, that's fine. Okay. okay, so then maybe let's change continent. Let's, um, so Shiraj uh, Minwala. Um. Uh, hi, Sabrina. Uh, a quick question, and maybe you said this, but I sort of missed it. Uh, S matrices obey the, you, this unitarity equation, SS daggers equal to one. The, is that automatic from your celestial point of view, or does it, is it a condition that imposes conditions on correlators um, from the celestial sure, point of view? I would say that it probably has to impose conditions on, yeah, it has to impose conditions, right? So, um, yes. So what 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 I think, like, so Hotat and, and Xu Hong's paper started looking into that. And then I believe also the recent paper on, um, uh, that, that came out basically last week also does, I believe, look at constraints and unitarity there. So, so basically we know that it's the same object. So it's the same S matrix, it's just in this different basis. So even though the, the one, one side of people like trying to define the celestial CFT intrinsically, like you wanna see, I guess like radial quantization, how you define the state operator correspondence there, et cetera, like, and see if there's a notion of, of unitarity that you can make sense of, it doesn't look like a unitary 2D CFT. So we know there is unitarity, it's encoded somehow in, 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 in features of this guy. Um, and so it's definitely an extra constraint on top of it. So it's like extra um, constraints on top of like the, the data in, in the CD. But I don't, I don't think I would right now be able to list off like a nice kind of example, but I know a couple of papers I would point to um, that might be of interest, which would be Hotet's and, and Xuan's paper, and then the, the, the Chang, Huang, Huang, and Li paper should say something to that effect. Okay, thank you. Could I ask a follow up, please? Yes. Okay. Um, you, you talked about how these, uh, in, in the context of um, uh, I think photon scattering, you talked about how amplitude spl split up into a soft part and a hard part. Yes, yes. Does the hard part obey a unitarity type equation by, by itself? Is, does it obey some sort of Kutkowski's rules that are modified by the fact that it was dressing, it was dressed by the soft part? I don't know if I say anything too strong that somebody who knows it from the amplitude side of things could come in and, and tell me I'm wrong. But my, my impression would be that I think that you can, I think it should be consistent to, to scatter dressed particles. Um, but and in, in that situation, then one would imagine that like any statements about like unitarity among the dress particles would then follow like you're saying. Um, I think that maybe there's some issue of like IR cutoff coming into that definition because even in, in this definition of these vertex operators, there's the IR cutoff in the um, in the, um, the 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 phi is somehow like the, the the two point functions have an IR cutoff dependence. So. Um, I again welcome like whatever, every time I'm answering questions on behalf of a great group of people, I'm happy if the people or authors on, on those papers want to say something that I'm not saying as well as they would want to. Um, but yeah. in this situation, um, I think I think that one should be able to consistently consider just stress scattering. Um, 
And then I would imagine, like, I guess the question would be, like, it's, there's like some shifts in the comfortable dimensions and a little, like, it, it might not be, I'm not sure how easy it is to, to look at the, like, conformable lofty compositions of these dress guys in particular as impaired, because like, the way that they're written out is still defined in terms of typically, like, um, like, you, you normal order and you have this dressing for each particle. So like, I don't, I think maybe once you have more of this celestial CFT techniques down, you can do something more fruitful with that, because I think still you'd be kind of computing things like with like cloud to cloud, um, like exchanges and stuff like that. So, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, is Simon Karunhut is waiting for quite some time already, I think. So, uh, he's still ahead. Yeah, th thanks for the talk. So well, one of my questions was already asked by, by Shia. So yeah, let me just reiterate that it would be very nice to work out what unitarity means for this yeah. hard amplitude. But uh, my, my, my question is about uh, uh, crossing symmetry, which mm -hmm. you know has always been a very fruitful tool in CFT. Yeah. So, so do I understand correctly that this distribution nature of the four part particle amplitude is making it a bit. Uh, it's weird. So right. it's definitely weird. Um, so okay. So can you can you comment on? Yeah. I'll comment. I'll make a lot of comments, and then um, also mention caveats. Where like, wait, so the first comment is that for two to two somehow there's something kind of nice, which is that um, the uh, you're you're on this so you're on the circle here. Um, and the kinematics of in and out actually happen to be such that like basically on the circle, there's an ordering where in and out have to alternate around in order for momentum to still be conserved. And so what happens then basically, if I do a, just a SL2C transformation to put one point at like, you know, zero, one and infinity, wherever that fourth point is, there's like basically three, it can be here, it can be you know, like, it, it can be basically between the other three. So say this is the fourth one, it can be here, here, here. Those different kinematical crossing, um, are then like step functions. So basically instead of a circle, it's actually an interval like between two of these points where, where you have support. So, um, okay, that, that's, that, that, the, the, the weird thing what happens is that the, so, so, so basically um, there's a sense of which just for two to two, at least it doesn't go to higher point. Um, the, the amplitude defined in those different ranges are the different crossings. So somehow if you add overall crossings where you see this to avoid these theta functions in the, the recent theta by Taylor at all, um, you can get around that. Now, the funny thing about it, what, what comes into a problem with is you also want to think about crossing in the 2D CFT. And so when you have this kind of restriction, um, naturally then uh, the channels that you're allowed to do like an operator product expansion around somehow are related to the crossing in, 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 in 40. So that's a problem people have run into is essentially like sometimes integrals to, to uh, convert the, um, the conformal block decomposition are uh, easier to do in a channel that isn't actually the one that's supported for like the point of view of the, the kinematics. So I would say that I think that the paper with Hotat and Shu Hung pointed out an issue with um, the behavior, uh, like the phases whimsy, but I think that that could have been an artifact of like you want to put the, the negative sign for like the, the melon transform into the definition of the cross guy. So um, I would say that crossing isn't fully understood from this point of view, but I do want to say that like a very like Okay, so the, the picture that you have right now is that you have a, basically a, not a light ray operator, but an operator sitting at null infinity integrated with U to some power for future null infinity and V to some power for past null infinity. To pick out positive or negative frequency modes, I have an I epsilon prescription on the U or the V to select A or A dagger. Now, if I go to 2, 2, that guy should somehow, like, like there should basically be a pi rotation in the, the time coordinate uh, between those two. So what I think is, is natural is that somehow you have this, like, like O plus and O minus, if you can continue to two, two and back should somehow be like the same guy um, moved around. So I think that like the next interesting thing is people who are more, more comfortable like looking at contours and complexified coordinates are gonna notice that um, how crossing would manifest itself if, if you, if you um, and if we continue this, this um, celestial sphere. Um, I think I've, I've said I've said all these interesting issues people run into with your crossing but haven't just given you an answer. And I think that the answer then is that basically it's active area. Uh, I think uh, we can um, delay this to the um, afternoon session. So we have uh, by, by Tom and um, Andy, we have um, plenty of time for discussions because I was uh, told by the super chairman that we should move on. Uh, so let's thank uh, Sabrina again for this wonderful talk. And um, so